Greetings, fellow nerds, and welcome to another episode of Between Two Nerds. I'm Jeff Doyle, and with me, as always, is my friend and co-conspirator, Jeff Tensura. Hi, Jeff. Hey, Jeff. Good morning. How are you? How have you been? Doing, uh, doing great. My son is getting married this afternoon, so right after this, I'm jumping into the monkey suit and uh, and off to a wedding. That's amazing. Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> And we have a very special guest with us today. Hi. Sharada. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm Sharda. I'm from Juniper Networks. And I manage uh, uh, some of the ASIC chips that we build for the networking in, in Juniper. Yeah. Thanks for giving me opportunity to talk in this webinar. Oh, Looking thanks for joining us, Sharda. It's our pleasure. And we both, we've been following your articles on LinkedIn and online. And we think you are amazing. Thank you. So yes, I'll do some short intro to why we do what we do today. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so normally we talk about routing protocols, software design and scale. However, there were a couple of topics that draw our attention. Uh, most significantly, recent discussion, none of least about 400 gig Ethernet, and it went in details to how we schedule packets, how pipelines look like, explanation of what different pipelines are. And unfortunately, all of us who deal with ASIC vendor directly have signed numerous NDAs. So it's easier not to, to tell you what we cannot talk about than talk about something, right? So mm -hmm. the intention here really to get people who are building this stuff actually understand this stuff such as Shraddha and provide their different perspectives on evolution on current situation in ASIC market and why we do what we do. There are different segments and different ways to build ASICs, as well as their view on the future, where we are going. You know, we are hitting 3 nanometer. What's next? How do we go smaller? And uh, mm -hmm. here, Sharada is going to lead us through her view on this and uh, give us more understanding of what uh, Juniper is doing in this area and comparison between different uh, ASICs targeting different markets. Yeah, this is this is the beginning of an exciting topic because uh, there's uh, there's really a dearth of information, in my opinion, out there about uh, you know everybody talks about you know well you know you buy these particular switches because it has this particular silicon set in it or this particular chipset, but you know there's never really a lot of detail, in my opinion, uh, available about well why does that matter so much and what goes into uh, um, you know, what's under the hood <laughs> um, in these ASICs, which, like Jeff said, you know, sometimes is proprietary and sometimes, uh, you know, at least at a high level, you know, it's, it's things that we should all as engineers be able to understand more. And, and we have lined up great uh, number of speakers from different companies. So no one is getting professional treatment as always. No marketing, no BS. That's our rule. And you will see perspective from different vendors, from different markets, why they do what they do, and uh, some comparisons. So, yeah, sure. Yeah. You could go ahead and take it from there. Yeah, Shraddha, I believe you've got some slides for us, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I thought that's probably a good way of going through my thought process so I don't miss out on anything. Uh, so, yeah, Jeff asked me to talk about, like, you know, uh, semiconductor industry. Uh, evolution and how the network ASICs evolved with it, like both in Juniper and outside of Juniper. And so I'm going to talk about that first. And after that, like, you know, I want to give a comparison of the two architectures that uh, we, we are always like, you know, supporting on the Juniper networking silicon and uh, pretty much the industry as a whole also kind of consolidated around uh, two kinds of architectures, one for like, you know, uh, fixed pipeline processing and the other one is the flexible pipeline processing, right? I would talk about that. And uh, after that, like, you know, we can talk about the future trends, where we are headed, like, you know, we are in three nanometer process node now and what's next and everything. So that's um, that's how I plan to go about it. So feel free to interrupt me if you have any questions. So then otherwise, like, you know, I'll talk through some of the slides I have here, okay? We're never so, shy about interrupting. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, yeah. 
so the very early days i start with ancient history so very early days like you know uh, cpus were doing most of the switching and uh, they were very slow and the bandwidth was not enough and as we have this dot com boom and everything people saw the need to like you know build custom networking chips and change the game right so that's when many startups like you know they were funded and then some of them were successful and some of them kind of died and the biggest challenge at that time was like you know uh, doing ip lookups in the hardware like you know whoever were kind of figured out how to do that they pretty much had like you know some kind of recipe for success right and juniper introduced its first uh, uh, routing system like it's 40 gigabits per second the entire uh, system uh, with ipv4 lookups in the hardware then I, at the late um, like you know as we are approaching 2000 like you know the end of that uh, last century we saw a lot of consolidation that was happening in the industry some startups died and then um, mainly juniper and cisco they remained as main contenders uh, on the routing chips and then we have broadcom cisco and couple of other small players like extreme and other companies they were there on the switching side right um, then uh looking at the trends in this century right uh, i would put them in three major uh, uh, segments uh, or like you know the era or decades i would call it the very first one is the speed era like you know here like you know the moore's law is in full swing uh, if you guys know about the moore's law like it's like every 2 to 2 to 1/2 years you are doubling the density of the transistors that you can put in a uh, unit area of the die right so we were able to double the density we were also able to like you know double the performance as well like from every node to the next node right so in this era we saw like you know rapid increase in frequencies and the transistor densities right and on the cpus were continue to dominate on the computing side so if you look at it in this chart right i mean this is like i'm putting juniper asic as an example but uh, pretty much like you know outside of the juniper as well like you would see the similar trend on the networking side right at the beginning of the century we were building this uh, pfes which is like a packet forwarding engine or a unit like you know that's doing the switching or the routing right so these pfes consisted of about 10 chips and probably like uh, some 250 nanometer processors or something like that and they were running around 150 megahertz by the end of this decade we were actually like running them at much higher frequency like 800 megahertz so you see that's a five fold increase in 10 years right and we also consolidated because the transistor densities were increasing so we were able to put like you know lot more uh, functions inside the uh, inside a single die so we didn't need 10 chips and then we were able to do all of that in one or two chips and that's where like you know you see like you know five fold increase in the density as well right and we were still at the sweet spot where memory is not a bottleneck external memory so we were using ddr2 and rld ram for uh, any external memory access and because we are getting all of this like advantages by going from one node to the other node like for example like you know you you have a chip and that is like either too slow or like you know too hot or like too costly right you just wait for the next process node and then you respin the chip and even if you didn't have any uh, innovation inside the chip just because you respin it in the next process node you're going to get double the advantage like you know you're going to get like you know double density double the performance and things like that so people even though we have all this hardware for doing this ip lookup and stuff like that majority of the stuff was still happening with microcode engines or embedded processor cores so there's not too much of innovation because process advantage itself was giving you all the all the things that you need to keep up with the bandwidth increase right and ethernet links they were like you know around like you know by end of the decade we were around 100 gigabits per second and cerdis were running around 25 gigabits per second so at the end of this decade is when Juniper introduced this um, uh, new architecture. I mean, the systems based on the new architecture that we call it Trio, and that's based on the fully flexible packet processing, right? And that's what this 800 megahertz, two to four p uh, PFE chip is. Uh, that's what it talks about. Okay. Then the next era, right, is I call it like a system-on-chip era. Uh, what we are noticing is that. 
by the beginning of this uh, decade, Moore's law, we are starting to see a slowdown, right? And mainly it's because even though transistor density was increasing, memories were not scaling. The embedded memories that are uh, inside the die, they were not scaling that much. And the performance was also kind of flatlining in the sense we couldn't, in, I mean, get the frequency increase without increasing the uh, operating voltage of the uh, transistor. So, and we didn't want to like, you know, blow up the power either, right? So pretty much the transistor performance started flatlining. So that's what you would see in this era. If you see that like in the beginning, we were around like, you know, chips that are clocked at about uh, 933 megahertz. And at the end of the decade, we were still around that range, like, you know, 1.12 gigahertz or something. So we don't see the performance improvement, but we do see a density improvement. So we continue to pack things inside, like, you know, we are like, you know, we are continue to put like, you know, more and more functions inside the die. So we were able to like, you know, squeeze from two to three chips from PF, for a PFE to one chip for a PFE. And we could go even further and we could even cram in multiple PFEs inside the, uh, inside the die as well, right? And this kind of goes side by side with what the CPU industry was doing. There, you know, in this decade, we have seen like, you know, they were also packing more and more of CPU cores in the same die, right? So networking side also, we were seeing like, you know, multiple slides. We were not able to put as many, co I mean, their like CPU cores were smaller, but in the networking side, we were able to squeeze in like, you know, more than one PFE inside the same die, right? And here, the DRAM bottleneck, like, you know, the difference in performance between the, you know, transistors and the memory, external memory, that has started to become really bad. Like, you know, the gap was like increasing. So there is more innovation on the memory front it also. Like, you know, the in the middle of this decade, we started getting this like, you know, 3D stacked memories. Those are like HMC memories. Like, you know, they are like, you know, connected to the chip through the high speed surges. And we also had like, you know, HPM, like, you know, the 3D stack HPM memory that you can put inside the package and then connect it with the die. So those were the things that uh, started coming in this decade. So here, if you look at the networking side, uh, we were consolidating more things like, you know, queuing and packet processing, all of that is going into a chip. And we introduced a new architecture. We saw the need to introduce a new architecture at this time, just because like, you know, we were not able to scale as much as we were able to do in the last decade. So that's what we call it an express architecture. So the main reason for this architecture is how do you overcome the memory bot bottleneck? Like, you know, so you have to make sure that, you know, your data is not moving to the external memory as much uh, too many times, right? So the architecture has to solve that problem. And the second thing is how do you um, pack more bandwidth in the chip, right? So if you were to do like, you know, flexible pipeline versus fixed pipeline, Usually, like, you know, whenever you have a function that is hard coded, that's going to be smaller and more efficient in the area, right? So then you are able to pack more bandwidth in the hardware. So that's the main motivation uh, for starting the fixed pipeline processing. And we started that around the first uh, decade, like, you know, around the early 2010s is when we introduced the express architecture. And the bandwidth was increasing, the bandwidth demand was increasing a lot thanks to all the video streaming and then AR, VR applications and everything. And links were also, ethernet speeds were also going up. And by the end of this decade, we were around 400 gig ethernet with 50 gig surges. And on the non-networking front, you would see like, you know, more domain specific architecture. So they were also seeing the same thing that, you know, they, you cannot do everything with the CPU, right? So you need like, you know, more uh, uh, custom chips that can cater to specific applications. So we had GPUs that for graphic processing, and we also have started seeing this proliferation of um, TPUs and other like, you know, machine learning chips, like AI chips for doing the machine learning training and everything. So the thing about this decade is that people were so focused on like, you know, packing so much in the die, right? So the die sizes have gone, gone up so much, like, you know, for the high-end networking chips, and also for like, you know, if you look at the CPUs, we have reached the reticle limits of the die. Like, you know, reticle limit is the uh, is the maximum die that 
you can cut out of the wafer using the existing manufacturing processes. And you can't go beyond that unless like you change some of the like, you know, process in the equipment. And the downside of going uh, with the reticle limit is that your defect density is also increasing exponentially. So if you have like more defects in the dye, then your yield goes low. And if the yield goes low, the cost of the dye increases, right? So all of these, we were hitting pretty much a wall on how much you can grow inside the dye. So that's where uh, this decade ended, where you know things are all packed fully. You have no space to grow, and this is so much you can do. Then what else can you do after that, right? So let's stop at this point and uh -huh. try to kind of identify a number of conflicting <coughs> trends. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. one of them is obviously the die size, it's physical limit, and you cannot go above. Otherwise, you use the thing that goes to nothing. Uh, mm -hmm. We need to decide how do we use space available, whether it's a your memory access, and what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. uh, power consumption is obviously very serious consideration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's also interesting is uh, the frequency doesn't grow. If we look at all modern silicon, it runs at about 1.5 gigahertz, right? And it's been like this for a really long time. So you really need one clock per packet. And this is where we hold it. And I think we won't see any significant increase in frequency. It just doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. So we are not growing in frequency. Growing number of cores while kind of normal way to scale out uh, increases power consumption and efficiency in between. So how do we trade off between all of these different things and continue growing? Yeah, so that's where right, um, uh, I was talking a little bit about that. So we need, we cannot have a one silicon that can do everything, right? So if you really want, like that's where we have to make the trade-offs and build different silicon hardware for different applications. Mm -hmm. So if your bandwidth, let's say like, you know, you are in a core routing or like, you know, transport routing system, and bandwidth is the highest uh, um, uh, important, like, you know, most important thing that you want to get. But you can go a little bit easy on the scale or you can go a little bit easy on how many protocols that you want to support because mainly you're doing like, you know, L3 forwarding and stuff like that, right? You could build a silicon that can compromise on the scale. So you are reducing the size of the time. And you can also like, you know, do more like, you know, hardware uh, hardware acceleration, like the fixed pipeline that I was talking about, which caters to specific applications. So that's how people tackle the problem in this decade. When they saw that, you know, they cannot grow anymore, they went back to the whiteboard and started thinking about what kind of architectures that we can build that will cater to the specific applications. That's where, like, you know, you saw the TPUs come up, like, you know, instead of using CPUs, right? Similarly, on the networking side also, you have seen, like, you know, people starting to differentiate within the router itself. The routers, like, which have high scale, which have low scale, the routers, like, you know, which can do, like, you know, more protocols versus, like, less protocols, right? And there, there is more innovation on the architecture front before like you know like you know memory was like you know memory memory bandwidth was always available right then you would send every single packet out to the external memory for buffering right now when you figure out the memory bandwidth is precious you have to like come up with a scheme like you know what can i do right so then there are things like okay i'm not going to send everything to the external memory i'll keep them on chip and only when the queues are getting congested, I'll go to the off chip. That's one of the things that, you know, uh, we compromise, like instead of giving like, you know, full bandwidth to the external memory. So there is um, there is this innovation on the architecture front. And there is um, there is this segmentation in the sense like, you know, you are not building the same chip for uh, that caters to every application starting from code routing to switching. And um, there is like, you know, more and more of, um, uh, I mean, it mostly it's mostly innovation. I mean, how do you reduce the data moment, right? That solves both the power as well as the memory bottleneck. So that's what that happened, I would say, in this century, in this decade, sorry, in our century. Yeah. So besides the way you are processing packets, do you also see the differences, how they're connected? So if you need more bandwidth and functionality, you would have more uh, service dedicated to IO versus memory and other way around if you need seven levels of QoS and BRAS functionality. Yeah. 
yeah so one is the processing the second thing is like how much you can compromise on the qas like you say right like you know how fancy you want your schedulers how much of the scale you want in the hierarchical qas and things like that right we can compromise on those fronts as well like you know depending upon the applications right in the memory front uh, that's where i said right like you know we were uh, transitioning away from ddr memories to hpm memories so you get like you know higher bandwidth and you are also reducing the power because like you know that memory is inside the package so the electrical internet um, uh, interconnect power is also reduced so, so in you say hpm you are specifically talking about off chip memory right no when i say hpm i meant the 2.5d package where okay. You can actually bring that, uh, yeah, bring the HPM, the 3D stacked uh, external memories inside the package. So that's what I meant. So that kind of uh, gave both bandwidth advantage and the power advantage uh, because, like, you know, it's uh, so close to the chip. So your latencies are slow and your power consumption on the electrical interconnect is also low. Makes sense. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So we were at the, at the end of this decade, we were with the chips that are pretty big and pretty fat, right? And we can't uh, grow beyond those, right? So that's when we entered this era, like, you know, where people are like, you know, starting to investigate more into what can be put in the package, right? So here, the focus is not to build a biggest die that can fit the entire package, but you build more reasonably sized dies and then connect them together with like, you know, short like die to die links and put them in the package. So that's what we call it like a system in package era. Uh, if you look at it, CPUs are already doing that. Like, you know, there's Apple and AMD, as far as I know, they have this multi-chip uh, packages. So they have like, you know, they put multiple, like, you know, this uh, processor dies inside the package and they also integrate the HPM. So even on the networking side, you see more of that happening. Like, you know, heterogeneous integration. When I say heterogeneous, each die could be in its own process. Like, you know, you have a HPM that's like a memory and you could have some chiplets that could be in its own single uh, different process. And then you can have a core die, right? So that's where uh, uh, the market is trending now uh, because we cannot grow the dice anymore. So we have to grow the package and make the packages like more complex. A on question the, here, most people see external messaging where one company would say we are single monodie company and that's why we are so great another one say, look we're using 25 chiplets and that's why we are so great mm -hmm. but i think it would be good if you could provide some insights as to where would you use one versus another and where are the trade-offs yeah so it all depends upon in the end the cost and the power right so it depends upon like you know if you if you are able to like you know get your cost advantage with whatever vendor relationships that you have and your power is within uh, the envelope that you are targeting for you could go for a single die package as well uh, but then if you want to grow like you know let's say you want to like double the bandwidth from what you had from the previous chip and your process node is not giving you that advantage and then like this doubling the bandwidth is important for system perspective right then you would go for the multiple um, die package it depends upon like you know how much um, uh, um, yeah it all depends upon your uh, cost and power envelope like you know what you are trying to achieve in that um, in that time frame right so there is like you know both uh, pros and cons uh, if you put multiple dice in the package, package cost is more expensive. Whereas if the die is bigger, die cost is expensive. So that's where, like, you know, uh, specific to the application, you have to make that choice. That's what I would say. Great. Thank you. Okay. So then, yeah, on the, we have, like, one more thing we have seen is, like, in this era, you would, you have, we have started seeing more and more of the smart NICs too, like, you know, the DPUs and IPUs where you have networking functions are also going into the NIC to offload the CPU servers. So we have seen a more proliferation and a lot of startups in that area. Okay. I think there is one uh, publicly unknown device, which is Aruba Switch that has been some the NICs in it, eight or 16 of them. So we already see switches that actually use, uh, and not NPUs, but smart NICs as uh, uh -huh. IO interfaces. Okay. Uh, with the multiple die packages, you mean? No, they use a number of pins on the smart needs. Or okay. The yeah. To yeah. actually process the packet. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. So, yeah, this is for the uh, networking silicon trend. 
next topic um, unless you have any questions i want to go a little bit deeper into the two architectures that i talked about the flexible uh, yeah, right. yeah sure that's okay yeah okay so these are the i mean uh, packet forwarding architectures in juniper so like i was telling uh, before like you know one size doesn't fit all right so we can't have like one silicon and then we say we can do everything from edge routing to data center switching right so because each application has different uh, requirements uh, if you look at the business edge routing cases like you know your logical scale is high you have more congestion so you want like you know more packet buffering and you have like more protocols to support as well like more uh, more uh, combinations of tunnels and stuff like that whereas single chip bandwidth you probably don't need that much of it there and core routing comes kind of like next to it where you do need like a larger route scale but it's not as large as what you need in the edge routing uh, you need packet buffering but there's a potential for oversubscribing the packet buffers and header processing mostly you are doing like you know l3 forwarding or mpls label switching so you don't need like you know too much uh, too many fancy protocols to support then comes the data center switching right in the data center switching you just need like you know uh, pretty high bandwidth switches because of all the scale out architectures like you want to connect like you know tons of leaf and spine uh, switches together and header processing is probably the minimal uh, you are either doing the l2 forwarding or you're doing some kind of exlan or ngre uh, stuff packet buffers is also minimal because they, they they will control the congestion with other mechanisms like ecn or things like that they we don't we don't want like things to be congested inside the data center network right and logical scale is low as well because you are not doing like you know millions of route lookups or anything right so those are the different um, uh, applications and as you can see each one has different need right so in juniper side we are focusing mostly on business edge that the edge routing on the left side and also core routing right and we are targeting trio um, architecture for the uh, edge routing applications and we are doing core routing we are targeting our express silicon which are like you know pretty high in bandwidth and power efficiency when it comes to data center switching uh, we continue to use merchant silicon because like they have figured out how to do these switches like you know pretty high efficiency and then with low cost so we decided to use the merchant silicon so i would talk about trio and express in more detail now so first before we go into uh, what is trio i wanted to like kind of like make you guys understand some of the terms right the term pfp which i used before also right it's a packet forwarding engine right and and that's like a quantity that contains the queuing packet processing and the memory subsystem and a router whether it's a trio router or a ptx router or any router um, uh, that like you know any merchant silicon builds uh, the router consists of either one or more than one pfes um, that are like you know put together through a fabric right if there is only one pfe you don't need a fabric if there is like more than one pfe you have a fabric some people do the fabric using ethernet like you know they just use the ethernet links to connect to each other like on the uh, connect between the two pfes and some other companies like for uh, for juniper or broadcom and they have like you know fabric um, cellified fabric they have their own protocol on how the pfes can talk to each other so this is the concept of a pfe at a very high level so what we have seen like in the past in the last 20, uh, 15 years i would say that uh, from since the time we uh, introduced the trio silicon the pfe has gone through many uh, implementations right like i was telling in the beginning they are all multi chip like you know multiple chips have to be put together to call it a pfe then we have single chip pfes with more and more integration inside the die then we have multiple pfes inside the same chip so that's uh, that's how the evolution happened in terms of the pfe front similarly on the external memory also we moved from ddr to hmc to the hpm memories so this one i think i already um, talked about what's the pfe right so you have a lookup subsystem that's doing all the header processing then you have a memory and queuing subsystem so that's basically talking to the van and fabric interfaces and it also like um, have like you know packet data path and buffering and queuing and you have external memory 
The external memory in this case, I showed it like um, uh, here, like I said, data memory and deep buffer, right? So deep buffers are mainly for are the delay bandwidth buffer, like you know the place where the packet resides when there is a congestion in the network. Then the data memory is mainly for like you know uh, it contains the tables, like you know the FIB scale, the FIB tables, and then any tunnel scale, tunnel tables, or anything that you you need it for packet processing. It can also like hold statistics and stuff like that. Any questions here? Yeah, so I think uh, I'm not sure what's further on the slide. Uh, I think it would be useful if you describe uh, walk of a packet as it traverses yeah. the PFE, whether yeah. you are looking up on the headers, whole packet, yeah. how do you attach mm -hmm. metadata as packet traverses? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I I had a lot more detailed slide, but that would take the entire hour. So I kind okay. of cut it down a lot. Uh, so I would try to explain it at a very high level, right? Um, so if you look at this whole black box, that's the packet processing engine. You would see some small squares here, and you only see like what, like 12 here, but in the real chip, you have like, you know, we have hundreds of them, like, you know, 160 in the last chip that we were shipping. These are the packet processing engines, right? So these engines, uh, they get the packet head. Uh, when we call the head, the head can be the first um, 192 bytes or 224 bytes. I mean, it depends upon the implementation or like, you know, 128 bytes. These heads go to the packet processing engines uh, from the Q MemQSS, which is the queuing subsystem. And they stay inside that engine. Like, you know, a, a packet stays or packet head stays inside that processing engine until the entire processing on that packet is done. And the processing is happening through microcode instructions. So that's why we call it like a run to completion. And this is the key difference between like a pipeline architecture versus a, an architecture that depends upon the processing engines. In the pipeline architecture, packets are continuously moving through the pipeline, right? Whereas in this architecture, a packet stays there until like the processing, like the microcode uh, program is done with the processing done with all the modifications on the head, then it is sent back to the queuing subsystem, okay? So to go a little bit deeper into this um, complex, right? The We call it the lookup complex. We have in the Trio 6 that we just announced about six months ago, uh, we have 160 P PFEs and inside with 160 PPEs, we call it packet processing engines, right? Inside each PPE, we have multiple threads. That's how we get the performance boost. While these things are pretty flexible and they can do a lot of things, we were also adding some acceleration. So kind of offload this microcode program from things that are very predictable. Like, you know, that we know they're not gonna change from like, you know, generation to generation. So we do have some hardware accelerators where we see a clear advantage of uh, like doing that with the hardware acceleration versus doing through the packet processing engine, right? Then we have data memory, which I already talked about, that contains the FIB and NextHop and all the other uh, databases. Inside the PP, if you want to like go deeper into the PP, uh, PPE, right? So this, this does based on a 256-bit wide VLIW instruction. So very long instruction word. It can do ALU operations, conditional um, uh, branching or call return or uh, like anything, the typical like, you know, instructions that, would, that you would find in a CPU. It's about eight stages of pipeline, right? And we have multi-threading. So that means we can have up to 20 or more threads in the, uh, that can be present at the same time. Every thread can be associated with a, a unique packet. So that way you could have up to 20 packets uh, sitting in that PP. So the key difference uh, between this and the CPUs is that we do the barrel pipeline architecture. So in barrel pipeline, we don't let the same um, thread go into the pipeline more than once. So a thread has to be inside the pipeline, complete the whole um, uh, execution through that pipeline before it can enter again, right? So the disadvantage of this is that latency of a single thread will increase, right? Because like, you no, know, it cannot enter back to back. Whereas if you look at a CPU, right? So you could have like, you know, the same thread entering back to back and you have bypasses, you have pretty complex, like, you know, mechanisms in place to make sure that, you know, the instructions are executed like in a sequential order, right? So all that complexity is removed. So we could save area and we could save power. 
because we are not so pressed about the latency here like you know that applications are not very latency sensitive but the thing is since you have so many threads that are active you could keep the PPE busy like you know every pipeline is busy with like a different packet right so you are getting a overall throughput the throughput is still there like your uh, total throughput is still there but single thread performance is not as high right so that's where what like you know the unit of processing here are you chopping packets and multiply processing units and use multi-threading to process them in parallel or each packet gets its own run to completion thread and then it runs with it till it's yeah. being processed so, uh, each packet is only associated with a thread so you are not like switching to a different thread before it finishes, right? That's why we call it run to completion. Okay. Since you have 20 threads, you could have up to 20 packets that are living in this PP. And everybody can be scheduled through this pipeline as long as they have come out of the pipeline, right? And this it's allows you to avoid reordering. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it is always like a single, a, a packet stays on the thread, is attached to the thread until um, the packet is done, like, you know, processing. Processing involves like, you know, removing the headers or modifying the header or adding new headers, like, you know, and our statistics, like a lot of things that uh, that needs to happen, right? In the processing, it's a typical processing here, okay? Great overview, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So the very important thing about the, uh, our uh, TRIO PPE is the emulation support. So the what does emulation mean here is that you have executable databases in the off-chip memory and software can write a microcode program to fetch the database to interpret the fields in the database and then take actions based on the field right so what it means is that you don't need to know upfront all the future protocols right any new protocol that comes or any new feature that comes you could emulate that using this um, uh, this feature that we have in the pp one example is that like you know the same hardware that we built this ppe we have we, i mean it's like a pretty solid one that we have been reusing pretty much um, in its same form like for over last 10 or 15 years right the same hardware that we built 15 years ago can support new protocols like segment routing or beer without a single change like you know inside the hardware because of the emulation support so that's one of the big advantages of the flexible pipeline processing is that like you know you you are able to accommodate the industry new standards or new protocols without um, a significant like you know delay in time like you know if you were to do that with a fixed pipeline you had to put it in the hardware then you have like you know three years to four year gap before the hardware is even seen in the field right so that's the difference i would say so question to you and your mm -hmm. opinion on to, to what degree forwarding programmability should be exposed to external users Right, so you see Barefoot or Intel model where you could do whatever you like and if you break, it's your problem. You've got other vendors that are kind of half exposed before, but probably you need to go back to vendor to ask them to do it because they've got yeah. proper validation uh, tool chain. Or you've got complete SDK model where if you need something, you talk to product manager, product manager talks to engineering, and next three spin, you get this functionality. Where do you think the real uh, point should be? Uh, so this is a pretty tough question because most of the uh, architectures that are there in the field now, they are not very easily um, can be converted to this P4 programming or something that is like, you know, like everybody can use, right? If we do expose our programming model to the customers, then if the customer is having like two or three merchant silicons, like in parallel, like, you know, in their, um, in their systems, right? They would have to learn each and every one of them, right? It puts a lot of burden on them. Um, in terms of like, you know, uh, adapting to this model where like, you know, they go and program our chips. Uh, whereas if everybody universally is supporting P4, then that is a possibility, uh, I would say. In terms of whether we should go that way or we should stay with the current implementation, it's, uh, it's a hard call because most of the architectures that we have, we have so much customer base. They are, I mean, you could make it, make them like P4 programmable. We could modify our software to make it like, you know, uh, P4 programmable so customers can add the feature. But unless that is in the mind from the beginning when you when you are defining the architecture, you won't get the full advantages of P4. You are just giving like, you know, at a very high level some support, but it's not really giving that support, right? So I, I, I don't have a clear opinion on one way or other. Like both have pros and cons. 
I would say. Great. So yeah, in, in Trio, uh, definitely we are not letting customers go and program our chips. Like, you know, if there's a new feature that comes, like, you know, we have to give the support and then they um, uh, they do it. I think we lost Jeff or he's still there. I believe we did, but uh, I'm sure he'll come right back. Okay. Okay, so let me continue then. Yeah. So, yeah. So here, I mean, some of this I already talked about. Um, uh, this is here I'm focusing on how these packets are actually entering the PPEs, right? So we have a WAN interface that are connected to the Ethernet links and the fabric interfaces like for connecting to the other uh, uh, PFEs, right? Uh, when the packet comes, you split them into head and tail. Head goes to the PPEs, they are getting sprayed. Tail stays in the on-chip memory, right? Then after that, after all the processing is done, head comes back, then you are attached it with the tail, then you are queuing it to go out on the fabric. So that's what is happening on the ingress side. On the egress side, yeah, we do sellif a sellification on the fabric. Uh, unlike some vendors who actually use Ethernet for the fabric, we believe in having our own uh, fabric cellified protocol because it's more efficient. You are able to use the links more efficiently, so you don't need that much of bandwidth, right? We are able to actually like use um, if utilize our links more than 95%. So we cellify the packets. We send them to the uh, uh, fabric on the egress PFE. So. On the egress side, again, the same thing happens. The, the beauty of this uh, flexible um, packet processing engines is that the same engines can do ingress and egress processing. So on the egress side, now the packet is entering here. Again, you split that into head and tail. So tail lives in the memory, head goes to the PPEs, you do the processing. Now it is a egress processing, which is slightly different from ingress, where you are putting the new headers and you're adding end caps and stuff like that, right? Then it comes out. Then we go through the egress scheduler, right? Like the um, rich hierarchical scheduling that we do on the egress side. And then the packet goes out on the WAN interfaces. Any questions? Yeah, question the... here. Usually egress processing requires somewhat less power than ingress. Mm -hmm. When you build the chip, do you account for this or they're completely symmetrical? It doesn't really matter whether you do ingress or egress processing. So in this case, in a flexible processing, it's it doesn't care. The PPE doesn't even know what it's doing, egress or ingress, right? It's a generic PPE. So the software program loaded into it based on like you know where the packet is coming from, it's doing either ingress or egress processing. But when we come up with the number of PPEs that we want to put, we look at typical programs like you know what's the uh, total ingress processing and total egress processing. We put them together and come up with the number of PPEs that we want to support, like okay. you know for whatever the packet size is everything. This is agnostic of what processing that we do, the packet processing engines. They are generic microcode engines. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So this is a very high level picture of uh, the queuing of the trio architectures that we use. We call it input and output queuing, that CIOQ model, where a packet need is queued both on the egress and on the egress, right? But the ingress side, we go easy on how many queues that we have. We only have like, you know, a couple of queues for every egress PFE. On the egress side, you would see much like um, a lot deeper or like, you know, long, longer queues, 128 queues we support. The reason for the scale is we want to give the hierar hierarchical QoS, HQoS uh, support for the customers. The, in the business edge, that's one of the important applications, right? Like we need to give the support. So one thing about this is that this architecture is um, power wise, it's not that great because you want to queue on both ingress and egress, right? The second disadvantage is that the actual drops, let's say one van port is congested and the queues are building up and you need to drop them, right? You have to get them all the way to egress. Only then you would know that, you know, the status of the van queue and then you will drop it. So there could be a little bit of unnecessary data movement that can happen. But when it comes to scale, uh, this is like pretty superior compared to the other architecture that I'm going to show you uh, in a few seconds. Okay. Any questions here? That's. I mean, you're going to talk about uh, VOQs and differences, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. So now let's talk about the Express family. So the main intent I talked about is we want to do everything in a compressed format very quickly. And then we also want to have like, you know, lean memory and less data movement. 
So those are all the very high level goals, right? With Express, and we can do that, but we cannot. We just cannot target the business edge application. It has to be a different application, right? So the differences are pipeline packet processing, and you could see that the black box is now completely different here, right? So you have like you no know, sequential blocks, a packet or a packet head. I would say. I mean, packet head. It goes through each block. And then each block is doing a part of the uh, processing, then giving the results to the block downstream. And in the end, it comes out. Similarly, on the egress also, because egress always have like less processing, you have less number of blocks, and they do the same thing, right? The advantage of the fixed pipeline, like we said, is that it is like you know very predictable latency. So you know, like you know, the whole pipeline is going to end in some number of cycles, right? And it also it does give you a little bit advantages in terms of flexibility too. In the end, in a sense, like you know, you finish the entire processing and you want to do more processing, you want to look deeper into the packet, right? You could always recirculate it back and then send it through the pipeline again, the modified uh, packet, right? Once you modify the packet, you can send it through the pipeline again. So that way, it does have some flexibility. And the other important thing here is that unless you are accessing the memories on the chip. This small latency is going to blow up again. If you are like, you know, each of the packet processing blocks have to go to the external memory for its tables, then this latency is pretty much decided by the external memory latency, right? So we have to keep everything on the chip, on the uh, tables, right? So the advantage is that you are going to get very predictable latency. The only disadvantage is that the scale is limited because you can't put like, you know, um, gigabits of space uh, on the on chip SRAMs, right? That's the main thing on the packet processing. On the VivoQ architecture, which I will show with a uh, picture again. So the packets are only buffered once, like you know, buffered and queued once on the ingress, right? And once the egress PFE, and then they request the egress PFE, we have the same request grant mechanism and slightly modified protocol there. And where you are trying to send more packets. Uh, with one request instead of a single packet, you're at a single cell, you are sending more packets with one request. So once an egress PFE says, okay, send me the packet, right? So, and the packet goes to egress, it doesn't get dropped. It will, it will just go out. So that's the good part that you, you reduce the unnecessary movement, right? Because you are not going to egress and dropping the packet. And you are also reducing unnecessary movement to the external memory because, or the queue because you are only queuing the packet once. That's the main advantage of the Vivo queue architecture. Before I go into the Vivo queue, I want little bit. I want to show a little bit details of this packet processing engine. So you see, these are all the typical blocks that you would find in any fixed pipeline packet processing. Like you know, you look at Broadcom chips or other chips too, right? So you have a parser, source lookup, and you have filters that are doing the ACLs. Then you have a destination lookup that's doing the longest prefix match. Then you have the next hop processor, and then you are rewriting the packet, right? So one thing you notice here is that these are the circles that are here. What they mean is that we do give some flexibility to do more of one operation. For example, for a packet, you want to do more filters. Like, you know, for a packet, let's say you want to do more lookups. Like you want to look at the inner uh, inner header, then you want to look up the outer header, right? You have the flexibility to go back within this block and restart the processing again, right? So then one would ask, then it is not a fixed pipeline, right? I mean, if you are doing variable latency, it's not a fixed pipeline. but if, if every packet is going through the same processing, then you get the fixed latency for all the packets. If some packets belonging to a different flow, they want to do different processing, we do give that flexibility to do a different processing, but we can put them back in order depending upon the flow. So we do have this flexibility. That's why even though we call it fixed pipeline processing, in a way, it's like um, we do have some advantages that, that are there that comes with the flexible processing uh, for this architecture. Question here, <clears throat> if mm -hmm. you need to recirculate, do you have to go all the way to the end of ingress processing pipeline or you could do recirculation within different blocks? Uh, that's fair. The it depends upon the kind of recirculation you want to do, right? Let's say you want to do like, you know, more than whatever the target uh, filters that we can support, right? Then you can recirculate inside this block, right? When 
let's say you want to look much deeper into the packet okay you like let, we, let's say we are only sending 128 bytes down the road and we want now to start looking at the next 128 bytes right then you do all the modifications here update the packet then you can recirculate at the end to the uh, to the parser block again okay. So that way you are able to like, you know, do all the processing from the beginning for a header that is deeper inside, right? So we have variations, like I won't call this recirculation, but this is just like, you know, you're allowing more of the same operation to happen multiple times on the same packet. And if you go from here to here, which is the end to here, that's a bigger recirculation. Yeah. Uh, similar question. Uh... Mm -hmm. are you allowed to bypass some stages completely or you just pass with no opt through them uh all that options are available uh maybe like you know um the data sheet captures all of them of our chips like you know you can bypass some functions in the first processing you can look at it in the next processing so all that knobs that we do provide yeah. okay thank you okay so yeah this is fixed with uh, with the ability to do recirculation and with the ability to do more of the same operations within the blocks, right? That's the uh, express architecture. So now if you look at the similar diagram that I had shown for Trio, you see that all the buffering is on ingress, right? So in a Vivo queue, uh, what does it mean by virtual output queue is that for every PFE in the system, and it, within every PFE for every port in the system and for every queue for that port, you have a corresponding buffer on the ingress PFE, on every ingress PFE, right? So this scale is constant in the sense every ingress PFE is burdened with carrying this Q depth of the entire, chass entire uh, chassis or the system, right? So, but the advantage is that it's less head of line blocking in the sense like, you know, you can know exactly like, you know, if you want to send from this Q to this Q, you know the exact congestion here, so based on that, like, you know, this PFE is going to give you the grant and you send the data, right? So there's no head of line blocking. There are no drops once you come to the egress, right? So there are all good properties and latencies are less because of this, because like you are not like, you know, sitting and waiting here on the egress. There are good properties, but we have to sacrifice the scale. So that's why if you look at the scale of the hitch cost and things like that, it depends upon the PFE scale. Like, you know, you the more the number of PFEs in the system, you give lesser scale for some of these applications. Okay. Uh, would you say a few words about <clears throat> use deep buffers uh, to store some data structure that normally would be on buffer and, and then intelligently fetching them? For example, you know, you mm -hmm. keep hot flows on yeah. the buffer. Yeah. So that's one of the things um, more and more um, uh, uh, all the networking companies in the uh, are doing in this decade because we don't have that much of bandwidth to go to the external memory. So whenever, like you say, packets are buffered here, this buffer is not in the external memory. It all depends upon the depth of the queue. If the queues are not building up, they are first like, you know, only are residing in on-chip memory. I think that's what like you know other companies silicon one and others also do everybody is pretty much doing the same thing so and as the queues build up then we throw them to the like you know we send them to the external memory and they come back again to the on-chip memory when the queue build up like reduces so by doing that uh, we are reducing the bandwidth demand to the external memory so we don't need like you know we can oversubscribe it and we have seen that in the beginning, like, you know, when we introduced this concept, we were pretty nervous, like, you know, because this is something like, you know, we haven't done before, but we have seen that from the data that we have from the field, it doesn't hurt, like, you know, the traffic patterns are such that, like, you know, you don't see like so much of sustained condition on all the queues at the same time. So that's, the, yeah, that's what we do, so. Cool, thank you. Okay, so shall I move to the next uh, page? Yeah. Please do. Okay, so I don't want to give out more details because we are talking about this chip in the hardships conference. So if you guys do have time, do attend. So then you'll learn more about our uh, latest express architecture. Okay. So at a very high level, if you want me to compare, right? Uh, what are the differences between Trio and Express? Uh, I would say instead of calling it Trio and Express, I would say the difference between the fixed and the flexible pipeline processing. Uh, and the difference between the VivoQ versus like CIOQ, right? So there are two different orthogonal concepts here, right? So if you look at the fixed versus flexible pipeline processing, 
like I said, with the flexible pipeline processing, you have infinite programmability, right? And you don't need to look ahead in the future on what to support, right? For example, like, you know, usually, like, you know, when you start building a new silicon, right, silicon architecture, starting from the architecture phase to, like, you know, before the chip is already, like, you know, shipping, right, you have about three to three and a half years, right? So when product management folks are coming up with uh, coming up with the requirement they have to look ahead three to three and a half years so in that process they could get some things right they, we could be over designing with some protocols that nobody is going to use it in three years so there is always like some hit and miss right so that that's the disadvantage of the fixed pipeline processing is that you have to look ahead and figure out what you want to like you know support whereas with the flex, fixed by uh, flexible pipeline processing you do have the luxury of like, you know, not worrying about that. Like, you know, because like you just need to write this software program that emulates the new protocol and then you have that protocol support, right? So that's the advantage I would see with the flexible versus fixed pipeline. Whereas fixed pipeline, we all know, right? Like things that take um, like, you know, uh, whatever, like, you know, 10, let's say 100 cycles of delay in the uh, packet processing engines, fixed pipeline would probably take about 10 or 15. So there is like a lot of speed up because everything is happening through the pipeline. So you have less latency, very less power and, uh, and less area also. So when you have less area, then you get this luxury of like packing more bandwidth. So that's why if you look at our um, Trio versus Express chips, or if you look at any other merchant silicon who is doing between fixed and uh, flexible pipeline processing, the fixed ones can pack more bandwidth because they are not spending so much of the die area for packet processing. So that's the advantages and disadvantages. Then if you look at the power also, power per gigabit, right? Since you are packing more things, uh, your express or the fixed pipeline is going to do superior here. But when it comes to the scale, that's where I talked about the scale, right? This is not so with fixed and flexible pipeline, but this is more like the choices we made like, you know, we wanted to go with the CIOQ architecture for Trio, whereas the VOQ for Express, right? So CIOQ architecture has the advantage that you could get like a larger scale and you could get like a lot more superior QoS and scheduling properties on the egress because you have the entire data there, right? You can rate shape and you can do all the things like more accurately. Whereas on the Express side, uh, your scale is limited by the PFEs. Like, you know, the more PFEs you add to the system, the vivo queues per pfe go down right so you cannot like have that much of scale so that's the this is actually a difference between vivo queue versus cio queue say and the other thing about the express and trio is that in trio we do go uh, give a lot of scale because of the applications that we are targeting business edge so our data memory that's holding the tables that's all external memory it's very fungible our route scales is like in tens of millions Whereas in Express, we don't have the luxury to go to the external memory because the latencies are going to become larger. So we do most of it in the on-chip memory. We do give an option to go to the off-chip memory uh, sometimes, like you know when we wanted a larger route scale, but mostly it's in the on-chip memory. The scale-wise, that um, Trio is superior and Express, like you know, uh, it's it's for niche applications like you know routing and uh, uh, transport routing and all that stuff. Different so, uh, any questions? Otherwise, I will go to the next slide. Uh, let, let's go to the next slide. Yeah. So, yeah, this is just you asked me to show the trend, right? So, we this is the graph I borrowed from one of my one of the marketing slides. So, we do have like you know you see uh, the bandwidths are going up both on the both the architectures, but you see express architecture we can pack a lot more compared to the uh, trio architecture. And in terms of features, right? Yeah. So the feature wise, like I said, Trio can support anything you want, right? So you can pretty much add everything. Whereas Express, we are doing better and better, like, you know, we are by looking ahead. So you do see that the gap is reducing. But if you look at the differences, like, you know, the ones that are on the top, anything that has to do with the high scale or anything that has to do with some future application, Trio can support. Express, we added segment routing, beer, and all this like protocol support too in the Express Pi. So, so that's the difference in terms of feature coverage. So I think that's all about the architectures. If you want, we can discuss a little bit more about that, or I can go to the future trends. 
let's go to the future and, and uh, i would also like to discuss with you uh development in surge speed because it feels mm -hmm. like we are more and more gated by next generation surges than ability to shrink processing devices and mm -hmm. uh, i mean where do we go after 224 gig i mean pam 4 probably wouldn't give us anything more than that going to pam 6 yes I'm not sure it's a good option. So there's a lot of ideas and not a clear view on that. So if you have- I'm not a studies expert, but I'll okay. see if you can answer, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And be before we go there, I just wanted to mention uh, on the uh, viewer comments, uh, mm -hmm. a couple of people just chimed in about what a great presentation this is, and I totally agree. And mm -hmm. uh, one person asked if the, uh, uh, the recording for this will be available, and yes, it will. This is- uh, we always publish to YouTube, uh, so if you uh, look uh, for our uh, channel on YouTube, uh, just uh, between two nerds, you'll uh, you'll certainly find this uh, this topic on there too. As well as sixty other or so, sixty or eighty other presentations on all kinds of topics. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah this is pretty informative. The thing that you guys are doing, so. Okay, let me go to the future stuff, right? So we all know it's the end of Mursra, right? But the bandwidth demand is like, it's it's continued to grow. There's ever increasing demand all, uh, all the time and there's no end in sight with all these ML workloads and stuff like that. So where the future is headed, I would say, is that vendors, especially on the networking silicon side, will continue to offer different hardware that are specific for different applications. So that way we can optimize them better. So that's one trend I would see. Then the second thing I would see is that uh, people are talking about system in package and we have seen a lot of that that's happening on the CPU front. More of that will start happening on the high-end networking front too, in switches and like, you know, high-end routers and everything, system in package, uh, where you do heterogeneous integration of chiplets, memories, code dice, everything that you can pack in the package, right? So once you are done packing stuff in two-dimensional stuff, right? Now you have to start going up in the third dimension, right? So that's where the 3D packaging will come into picture. And uh, we, we, I do see, like I wrote it in one of my articles about the memory bottlenecks, that uh, this is inevitable. This, it's going to happen soon because you see that, right? SRAMs are not shrinking, right? You know, we are memory transistor. Even if you are getting the transistor. Uh, densities going from one process node to the other node, SRAMs are not like shrinking as much. Uh, for an example, when we go from 7 to 3 nanometer, you could see 50% reduction in the transistor uh, area, whereas XRAMs, you are only scaling by 80 or 85%. So when you do that, like, you know, uh, and then on the top of it, you are increasing the bandwidth. You want more queues to stay on chip, shallow queues. Those shallow queues need that bandwidth, right? You know, with the current, I mean, without like filling the entire chip with SRAM, then you don't have space for any logic, right? Then one obvious choice is that they can move to the third dimension, right? So that's the 3D package, like where you could actually move the SRAMs to the third dimension. You could also move some logic with the SRAM, right? The beauty of the 3D packaging is that uh, the new trend here, like, you know, new technology here is not to use the TSV, which are like, you know, uh, thicker um, uh, VRs, they use copper bo hybrid bonding, they call it CUCU bonding or the hybrid bonding, where they are a lot um, thinner in the diameter, and then their uh, the rules like keep out regions and everything are also a little bit more friendly. So the bandwidth that you can get from the die in the top or bottom to the next other die, right, it can be 10x more. Right? It's almost like you have that SRAM in the same die. You would potentially like would not even see the difference. right? So that's where I would think uh, people would start like exploring the technology more. And we are waiting more of that to happen on the CPU front. Then we can also like go and start using it. Right? Then we have, to, even with all this SRAM stuff and everything, we have to continue to reduce the data movements. And we have to come up with novel schemes, like, you know, hierarchy of caches and stuff like that. So you are like, you know, reducing the data movement. It has like a multiple advantages. It reduces your bandwidth pressure to the external memory. Also, it reduces the power and area, everything in the chip, right? And there's another trend that's happening, which is probably like more relevant for the uh, processing, like the general applications, like the in-memory computing, 
where you could send the data to the memory and then the memory can do some of the computing, right? I don't see how the networking chips can make use of it more efficiently, but there is some possible applications. Maybe you could do like some of the security functions there when the bandwidth demand is not that high. Like, you know, whether if every packet doesn't need to go to this um, IPsec or something like that, right? That could be done in the in-memory computing. Some network chips can take advantage of it, but I don't see how we can make use of it in our routers or chips like that. So that's what I would see. The biggest thing I am thinking that would happen is the 3D packaging, right? In terms of like, you know, how to get the uh, extra memory bandwidth. On the challenges on the power front, right? So we are seeing that process node itself is not getting the power advantage. You are barely getting like, you know, 15% reduction or 20% reduction. You're not getting anything more than that, right? So you had to further reduce the data movement. Like, you know, we had to continue to innovate on the architecture front. Even if the fee, we are not adding new features, like what can we do different, like, you know, algorithmic wise or the architecture wise, right? That needs to happen. And the other thing uh, which is happening a lot more already, which we can make use of it more is to reduce the packets per second, right? So that means before we used to build like, you know, a decade or like, you know, 15 years ago, whatever packet processing logic we built, we used to build it so it could keep up even with the 64 byte packets, right? So then you are like, you know, stressing the packet processing a lot. But now we can make use of the, you know, typical packet size for like, you know, most of the common applications like video applications and stuff like that. And we can start playing with that, like, you know, reduce the packets per second. And depending upon the application, then you are also reducing uh, the amount of logic that you need for packet processing. That's something we'll continue to play, which is already being done. But then like, you know, we will start pushing the boundaries, right? Then, EDA vendors, I think they have a very critical role uh, in this whole thing, like in terms of reducing the power. So they are already like, you know, spending a lot of um, uh, uh, R&D budget and then like, you know, research into like, you know, creating these tools that are capable of like, you know, doing automated uh, placement, routing, AI driven and all that stuff, right? There also you could squeeze in some power because the, even if your architecture is like you no know, best and then you have the best micro architecture if they are not placed properly like in the pd world right and then like you know you are you are like sending the data all over the block right then you are burning power so eda front also all the innovations that are happening on the eda technologies that would help in further reducing the power similarly like you know there are some vendors that can go and aggressively do clock gating for the uh, for the RTL, like inside the flops, right? Like if the flops are not being used, you can clock gate them. So that will play a key factor also in terms of reducing the power. Then the last one for the power is the uh, co-packaged optics, right? Like the one you are talking about, like, you know, services are not improving. What can we do, right? The biggest problem, like, you know, why the services have to be like, you know, so big and so power hungry is because they need to drive this long electrical channel before they go to the pluggable optics, right? So the channel consumes a lot of power. And then it. Uh, this is where if you look at the trend, like, you know, you go from one generation to the other generation, the percentage of the die power that's taken by the CERDES it's increasing. It's not like, you know, remaining constant because like, you know, certain like, you know, they need to drive more because as they end, they get like, you know, they're not, they're analog components. So they don't scale as much as the process node. So there are several things that are involved there. So one way to overcome would be to put optics, like, you know, the same, the uh, pluggable optics, just like, you know, you put them inside, like the optic chips inside the package. Uh, this is one of the topics of my recent articles. So where you use the silicon photonics and put all the optical components of the trans, rece trans receiver inside a die, and that die could be co-packaged, uh, just like all the HPM and all the other chips that you're co-packaging. You could also co-package the optics inside the uh, inside the die, right? So when you do that, uh, there are two things. One is happening, right? The CERDIS now that are inside the chip, they don't need to drive all the way to the pluggable optics, right? They are only like, you know, you just need it like inside the package. Now the optics are driving directly, right? So that's one innovation that I would think that would happen. But the biggest hurdle to using that in the routing side is most of our routing applications, we have like a long haul, right? Like, you know, we need a reach of like, you know, 80 kilometers or like 50 kilometer range. But the current technology in the optics is not there yet. It cannot drive that long distances. 
But inside the data center, I mean, um, your most typical lengths are like, you know, less than two kilometers. So the it is there like where the current silicon photonics optics, they could drive those distances. So I'm thinking that, you know, this transformation of like, you know, using the co-packaged optics, it will probably happen first for the data centers, for the switches in the data center or the smart nicks in the data center. Then once the silicon uh, silicon photonics um, technology matures and then you are able to like, you know, get like, you know, longer range and everything, uh, routers and other applications also can make use of it. So that's the challenge in power. I have just one more slide. Maybe I would just go over that as well. And before we go into the question and answer session. So then the other thing that we are thinking about, right? Like, you know, you have these networking chips and then they are switching the packets. What else can we do to make them more attractive? Like, you know, what can they do and that can save the power, right? And one interesting um, uh, te uh, technology, whatever the research trend is the in-network computing. Right. So this is mainly like relevant for um, applicable to the data center um, uh, switches. So you have all these like, you know, leaf and spine switches that are sitting in the data center. They are switching like, you know, tens of terabits of traffic. If we can add some logic there that can offload the CPUs or the servers, right, then we could save power and we could save like you know you could also use that cpus for something else right this is a concept that is extending the smart nick concept further like if you look at the smart nick right we were there's a cpu there is a nick and then you are offloading the network functions from the cpu to the nick right now we are saying can you offload a little bit more to the switches inside the data center right so that's the, um, uh, the that's one of the hot topics now and one Application where uh, we can see an immediate use is the applications where there is data aggregation that's happening. Uh, data aggregation means you have a lot of servers. They're all like, you know, sending traffic and somebody needs to aggregate that data and then send them back, right? And the classical one of map the reduce application. Hmm? Hmm? Classical map uh, reduce application. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, the main thing is the uh, uh, the first uh, the biggest application or whatever the uh, the most typical application for the data aggregation is the machine learning, right? Training, right? Yeah. If you are doing a uh, training of a deep neural network and you have a huge data set with millions of uh, data points, right? Usually, uh, how they do it is you are dividing the data set among multiple servers, and every server is doing its own gradient descent. And once they have an updated parameters, some server or somebody needs to aggregate all the parameters. Right? One way you could do that is that you could put a server that is dedicated for updating the parameters. So everybody is sending traffic to that server. Then that server is like again broadcasting everything else back to the uh, remaining servers. Right? The other way you could do it is you could chain them, chain all these servers. So everybody is like, you know, the first server is sending its parameter to the second one. Second one is aggregating it and sending it to the third one. So you create a chain, but then the chain needs to go back also to like, you know, propagate the parameters. Right? And that's a lot of delay. Right? So the, the place where network switches can help is you could do the aggregation inside the switch itself. So the servers are sending these parameters in, I mean, wrapped around as a packet and they're sending it to the switch and switches are doing this aggregation and they're sending it back to the servers. And we had, we have done a research in Juniper with MIT on this one where we use the TRIO packet processing. That's the beauty of um, flexible packet processing again. We didn't even know that, you know, TRIO can be used for this application until like, you know, we figured out how to do that. So we were using that to do a training and we did see the like, significant improvement in the training time and the training performance. And for more results, there is a paper there, like you know that uh, you could check it out. So this is, yeah, this is the area where uh, uh, different logics, non-network functions, can go into the networking chip and give you offload the servers. Right? There are other applications like you could use the caches, the the memories that are there in the networking chip for the for caching the key value pairs. You can also try to do inference inside the network chips. You could offload and do some security functions in the, or like, you know, other things like inside the network chip. So this, there's a lot of research 
um, I mean, for it to get to the reality, we need people to be writing software applications that that can take advantage of it. Then the hurdle is that you know whoever is writing the software application, they need to understand the hardware. Right? So that's where the, we have to overcome that bottleneck. P4 programming might help, but yeah, the, we need to figure out different ways of like making it a seamless process for the programming uh, program developers. I would say. Yeah, similar issues with whole edge movement, right? You need to write your software in a way that could be partially processed at that, partially central location, and mm -hmm. I mean, you need to understand yeah. the semantics and distance yeah. and data gravity. But this is an uh, absolutely amazing development. And I mm -hmm. remember early work on Memcache D uh, barefoot published. I mean, it wasn't very successful, but already mm -hmm. back then it was 2016, 17. It proved yeah. some. Uh, future benefits from using network chip for non-network mm -hmm. functions. Yeah. So yeah, that's all I have. Like, you know, I mean, the future trends and then potential non-network applications that networking chips can see. Shraddh, it has been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. I, I'm sure people really enjoyed it. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, so people usually watch it afterwards. Very few people watch it online and uh, they send their questions either on LinkedIn or on uh, YouTube sometimes. So we'll let you know if there are some additional questions so you could answer them. Thank you so much for joining us. And I see Jeff disappeared. OK. Hey, Thank you. Uh, have a great Thank day. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah. Back to you. Definitely.